Now let's talk about space and time. Wave-particle duality is another idea that comes in the modern physics of the time. Light sometimes behaves like a wave and sometimes like a particle. We can recognize in the history of the subject that physicists had been arguing about the nature of light for centuries. Newton, for example, thought that light was a particle. He called it a corpuscle. But after Thomas Young had done experiments to show diffraction as a phenomenon of light, it seemed that light was a wave, and that's what people thought for almost 200 years. By the early 20th century, it was clear that in some situations, photons behave like particles, little bullets carrying energy and momentum, but also light could behave like a wave and show the phenomena of interference, refraction, and diffraction. It also became clear that particles like electrons can behave like waves and show the phenomena of diffraction and interference. So waves behave like particles and particles behave like waves. This duality, waves and particles as different versions of the same phenomena depending on the experiment you do, is a fundamental attribute of the natural world. In special relativity, Einstein attacked and solved several important problems from physics of the 20th century. Laws of physics should not depend on relative motion. This is Galileo's idea of relativity. In constant uniform motion or at rest, the laws of physics should appear the same to an experimenter. But Maxwell's equations for light and the electromagnetic radiation have a single value in the speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. So the natural question arises, what is the reference frame or coordinate system within which light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second? What if the source of light is moving relative to a stationary observer? Or the observer is moving relative to someone who receives the light? In which system is the speed 300,000 kilometers per second? Einstein realized there was a conflict between the intuitive idea of Galileo's relativity and the constancy of the speed of light in Maxwell's equations, and he was determined to resolve this. Until this time, the only way people had understood the mechanism of electromagnetic radiation, especially as it travels through the vacuum of space, was to imagine that space was filled with an ethereal substance called the ether. The ether was supposed to fill space and the cosmos, and after Earth, air, fire, and water, it was actually the fifth element, quintessence, from ancient Greek times. So from ancient Greek times through Newton into the 19th century, it was always assumed that space was filled with ether, and this invisible ether would carry the light and define the reference frame for its universally constant speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. The natural question arose at the end of the 20th century, could this ether be detected? And you can see on the right the example of a diagram where we might detect it. If the Earth traveling around the sun is moving through the ether, then at different parts of its orbit, it's traveling at different speeds with respect to the ether. Is there an experiment that could understand this? Michelson and Morley in 1887 built an experiment to try and detect the ether using the motion of the Earth. The idea is shown schematically in the diagram on the left. Light was sent along two perpendicular paths by using a beam splitter and then recombined and the idea was to see if there was a tiny difference in the path length or the time taken for light to travel on the two arms of the experiment. Because in one of the arm of the experiment, Earth's motion in its orbit of the sun should add or subtract to the speed of light, and in the other direction, perpendicular to that motion, should make no difference. We see Michelson and Morley's apparatus on the right. And here is a diagram that shows the geometry of the experiment where in the diagram the Earth is moving around the Sun in the arrow towards the right. And we can see that in the arm of the experiment that's aligned with the Earth's motion, light passing through the experiment will travel a little extra distance or path length and therefore take a little extra time. So when those two light beams are combined, that extra path length in the motion where the Earth is traveling should cause a shift and an interference pattern fringe that was not detected. No matter what they did around the course of an entire year, no shift or fringe change was seen in this interferometer. This is a failed experiment, essentially. It's the most famous failed experiment in physics history. 
but its failure showed that there is no ether. And the implications are that all observers measure the same speed of light, regardless of the way they're moving, and that all observers are equal as long as they move at constant speed. And that is the new principle of relativity. And the final conclusion, the speed of light is a universal constant, but if the speed of light is a universal constant, remember speed is distance divided by time, then to preserve that universal constant, regardless of the motion of someone doing an experiment or observing an experiment or a light beam, then time and space must be altered. And that's the implication of special relativity. Special relativity creates philosophical problems too, or issues that have to be considered. Because what does it mean to have two events that are simultaneous? To declare simultaneous events means that we have to have two events at a different locations where we can synchronize a clock. So you have to send signals between two places to synchronize the clock to determine simultaneity. It's a bit of a circular argument. And time and space are conceptually and mathematically linked. In 1908, Hermann Minkowski, who did important mathematical work on relativity, said, the views of space and time which I wish to lay before you have sprung from the soil of experimental physics, and therein lies their strength. They're radical. Henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. This is Minkowski talking about the concept of space-time, a hyphenated entity where the two are joined at the hip and can no longer be distinguished. Einstein had this idea too, and we should always remember that ideas are sexy too. Here's the issue of simultaneity of clocks. Since space and time are connected in relativity and can be transformed into each other, measuring time consistently requires a signal to be sent and coordinated between remote locations. And this can only be done in a finite time because of the finite speed of light. And this creates the issue. Let's look at what special relativity involves. Someone watching a car accelerate toward light speed would see something very strange. It would seem as though the car itself was getting shorter and that time for the person in the car was slowing down. However, you wouldn't see these effects until the car began to approach the speed of light. At 90% of the speed of light, the car would appear to shrink to 44% of its usual length. This thought experiment answered Einstein's old question about what he would see if he traveled along with a beam of light. He simply couldn't make the trip, for at the speed of light, length would contract to zero and time would stop. Einstein, imagining riding on a beam of light, how does the universe look? There are three distinct implications of special relativity. Each is profound. One is the Lorentz contraction, named after another of the physicists who did the mathematical work on the theory. Special relativity describes the experience of observers in constant relative motion. As the speed of light is approached, to preserve its constancy as observed in any situation regardless of relative motion, length of an object must shrink in the direction of motion. A graph showing how it shrinks and contracts relative to the speed of light is shown. This degree of shrinkage is, is small unless the traveling is at a close to the speed of light or some substantial fraction of the speed of light. This is a real physical effect, not an illusion. All the three effects shown here have been confirmed in the lab with subatomic particles because we don't know how to make macroscopic or large objects move at anything like the speed of light. These effects are symmetric, so each member of a pair of observers would see the same thing and they follow from the constancy of the speed of light. The second effect is time dilation. As the speed of light is approached, time, as measured by a clock in the moving system, slows down. And the graph showing how much it dilates or slows is shown on the right. Again, this is a real physical effect. In the 1950s, cosmic rays, high-energy particles traveling through the Earth's atmosphere, were observed to hit the ground when the decay time of the particle involved should have caused it to decay in the atmosphere long before it hit the ground. The only explanation could be that time was being dilated by special relativity. 
as the particles traveled so close to the speed of light, and that's what let them reach the ground. So again, this effect is real. It's a physical phenomenon that has been observed many, many times in the lab. The third phenomenon is mass increase. As the speed of light of any object is approached, the mass of the particle or the object or the observer increases. On the right, you see how dramatically it increases as the speed of light approaches. Again, this is a very small effect at the normal speeds of our everyday life. It's not detectable at all because we only have everyday phenomena, the fastest rocket, the fastest spaceship, or small fractions of the speed of light. But once again, with subatomic particles, we can accelerate them too close to the speed of light. And as we do so, we see that their mass increases. Their momentum increases because that's proportional to the mass. Their energy increases. And this, of course, is an explanation, in fact, why nothing can travel faster than light. As you try to make an object move at light speed and put more and more energy into its motion, instead of increasing the speed to the speed of light and beyond, the energy continues to go into increasing the mass of the object. And of course, its inertia increases, its resistance to any change in motion, and so you can see the logic as this continues. More energy put into a particle will just make it more and more massive, but not increase its speed beyond the speed of light. Once again, this phenomenon in particular is observed in physics labs routinely and at every accelerator that does routine work. So we've measured these phenomena. Special relativity is confirmed as the foundation of modern physics. These effects lead to some interesting possibilities. This is not something we can realize, but it's a thought experiment. Relativistic time dilation creates a possibility of what's called the twin paradox, where two identical twins one of whom goes on a space journey at close to the speed of light and then returns, will find the other twin greatly aged. Because the one going on the rapid journey at close to the speed of light has experienced time dilation, and their true clock that they carry with them and their biological clock indicating their aging has slowed down. And so when they reacquaint, the other twin may have aged, might have dead, died in fact, depending on how long the journey was. Once again, we're unable to accelerate a normal person or a rocket or a spaceship too close to the speed of light to do this experiment. Perhaps one day in the far future it'll be possible. But the twin paradox is an inevitable consequence of this theory of special relativity. So there's a lot of philosophical thinking involved in relativity because these are not just abstract ideas. They apply to the real world. Einstein believed that at the time when physics was up in upheaval, physicists were obligated to become philosophers of science and so subject their new theories to philosophical scrutiny to ensure the foundation of their theories were sound. Einstein was a complete fan of theory and of philosophy. The scientist would know best, as he put it, where the shoe pinches, where things were starting to look tricky for the theory. Einstein said that philosophical thinking makes the distinction between a mere artisan or specialist and a real seeker after truth. Einstein really was a philosopher at heart, as well as a great physicist and a pretty good mathematician as well. As early as 1916, he wrote that the philosophical habit of mind prepared the physicist to question everything and not to accept certain ideas as given. Here's one quote, thus their excessive authority will be broken. They will be removed if they cannot, things cannot be properly legitimated, corrected if their correlation will be given things be too far superfluous, or a place of a new system can be established that we prefer for whatever reason. And he also said around the same time, the reciprocal relationship of epistemology and science is noteworthy. They are dependent upon each other. Epistemology, which is a theory of knowledge, without contact with science becomes an empty scheme. Science without epistemology is, if it is thinkable at all, primitive and muddled. Now during this time, the physics itself is getting weirder and weirder, presenting an extreme challenge to philosophers to interpret this new reality. And that's the end of this topic.